Good morning. Welcome to the online gathering for Samanac Baptist Church for Sunday, March 13th, 2022. My name is David Johnson. I'm blessed to serve as the pastor here at Samanac Baptist. We gather in person every Sunday at 10 a.m. If you're local and you do not have a church home, we would love to welcome you to our in-person gatherings. We're thankful that you've joined us for this online gathering. SBC family, a couple of announcements before we're called to worship first. Men's breakfast happens this coming Saturday, March 19th at 8 a.m. Men, would love to have you join us for a good breakfast at 8 a.m. and even better conversation. Secondly, during this Lenten season, we are collecting offerings that will, that will support Bruce and Linda Thomas's efforts in Poland as they seek to welcome, minister to, house, and bless refugees from Ukraine. If you would like to help us in supporting them, you can make checks out to Samanak Baptist Church and then in the memo line put Ukraine and those gifts, all of those gifts will go to their efforts there in uh, Poland to help those dear brothers and sisters who are coming over from the violence in their country. Also, Midday Bible Study continues to meet on Mondays, that's tomorrow at 1 p.m. here in our fellowship hall as we look together at Paul's letter to the Galatians. And then also on Wednesdays, we continue our midweek Bible study with Sandwich Church the Nazarene at Sandwich Church the Nazarene. Each one of those gatherings um, kind of stands on its own, so would love to welcome you whenever you can make it to be a part of our conversation. This online gathering is called to worship by a reading from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent you will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices. With shouts of joy, I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger, for you have been my help. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. This is God's word. Let us pray. King Jesus, we pray in solidarity with those in Ukraine, with those in Russia, against whom war has risen up, who stand under the shadow of their adversaries and foes, who feel as though and who are experiencing an army encamping against them. We ask that you would help them to have hearts that are not afraid. 
We ask you to help them to be confident in the Lord. Would you be for them their rock, their refuge, their shelter? We ask for justice. We ask for peace. We come to you in whose hand the hearts of kings is found. King Jesus, we ask you to intercede. You are the Lord of heaven and earth. We ask you to defeat evil. We ask you to restore peace. In you, Lord, our hearts take courage. We wait for you. Equip us to be strong. Give us patience to wait for you. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls that we, that the Ukrainians may be defended from all adversaries which may happen to us. And may you also protect us from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt our souls. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Our reading from the epistles today comes from Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 through chapter 4, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears, their end is destruction. Their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And it is from there that we are expecting a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord this way, my beloved. This is God's word. Let us now enter together into a time of prayer. King Jesus, with the psalmist this morning, our souls are waiting for God, our help and our shield. Our hearts are glad in you, Lord, because we trust in your holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we wait for you. Amen. Father, you are a God who stands ready to forgive us. So during this Lenten season, we come to you in a spirit of repentance. We come to you because your steadfast love is everlasting. We come because you promise that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we come to you for forgiveness. We come to you for cleansing. We come to you praying with the psalmist, remember your mercy, Lord, and the love you have shown from of old. Do not remember our sins in your love. Remember us. Let us take a few moments now and confess our sins to God who stands ready to forgive. You relieve that which troubles our hearts. You promise to bring us out of what distresses us. I remember before you those whose hearts are troubled, those who find themselves in distress. We trust you to consider their affliction and their trouble. And we also trust that you forgive us all our sins. 
hearts. The love of the world is filled with trouble. Let us now go to the God who notices and wants to hear us ask him to intercede. With the psalmist, we pray, wait for the Lord to be strong and let your heart take courage. Hear, O Lord, when we cry aloud, be gracious to us and answer us. Attentive God, we bring our prayers to you because we trust you to protect and provide in your mercy. Lord, hear our prayer. You lead us with your light and truth. We pray for ourselves and those dear to us. King Jesus, we remember before you those who are grieving. Those whose hearts are heavy. Those whose lives are enslaved to sin. Those who find themselves in oppressive situations. Those who find themselves sick. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. You provide in the words of the psalmist for the poor and the stranger. So we pray for our community, for our neighbors. We pray for Russia and Ukraine. Provide for those who are fleeing. Protect those who are under the violent oppression of a corrupt government. We trust you to protect and provide. We trust you to be attentive. And we ask you to intercede. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. You are the help and hope of all your people. So we pray for the churches in all places, and we pray for Samanach Baptist Church that we may be one. Lord Jesus, you are the head of the church. You are the head of this congregation. Help us to follow you as our head the one who did not demand his preferences, the one who did not want things to go his way, the one who instead bared with much that we might be healed. So would you deliver us from disunity? Would you deliver us from our selfishness? Would you deliver us from anything that divides us, and would you make us true to and faithful to the gospel of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, his exaltation, and his promised second coming. May we be faithful to announce that and also live like we believe that. And would you bring men and women, boys and girls, to acknowledge that this Jesus who was crucified was raised by God and installed as king of heaven and earth. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. All the nations, Russia, Ukraine, the United States, belong to you. We pray for the world, that your reign may come and your will be done on earth. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. God, our only hope, you seat us at the table with our enemies, breathing in our fears. Feed us from your mouth, feed us with your word, that our food may be to do your will. In the strength of your anointed King who taught us, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our reading from the Gospels today comes from Luke chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me, Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. And you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Before we unpack this text together, would you pray together with me, please, one more time? Lord Jesus, we come asking that you would proclaim to us the good news of the kingdom, that you would proclaim to us the good news of repentance and the forgiveness of sins, and that we would turn from anything which, which runs against your authority in the kingdom of God. And would you equip us to follow in the way that you lead us. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of our God remains forever. So now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock. You are our redeemer. And all of us said together. What's the most historically significant place you have been? In the comments on YouTube, in the comments on Facebook, tell us. Tell us the most historically significant place you've been. I've seen the White House and the U.S. Capitol from a distance. These days, they won't let you get too close. I've stood in the shadow of the Lincoln Memorial and at the pool near the Washington Monument. I've read from the 58,000 names that are listed on the Vietnam Wall. Each of these places feels heavy with history. But probably, in my opinion, the most historically significant place I have stood is in downtown Dallas. Dealey Plaza, Houston and Elm Streets, the sixth floor of the Texas School Depository, the grassy knoll, the X painted on Elm Street, marking the fatal shot that took the life of this nation's 35th president. This place strangely attracts tourists in part because of the world changing events that took place there on November 22nd, 1963. Whenever I see the footage of that terrible day, often something unrelated to the assassination comes to my mind. The Kennedy motorcade proceeded down Houston Street and made a slow left turn onto Elm Street where President Kennedy was gunned down. Outside of most camera angles behind Kennedy's procession is the Dallas County Courthouse. Almost 20 years ago, Yulinda and I sat in our car on Houston Street in front of the courthouse, fighting back tears. 
Let me back up a bit to set up some context. When Dalen was almost seven months old, we packed up our few possessions into a U-Haul truck. We left a community and a church that were fastly beginning to feel like home and, and drove over eight hours south to begin studies at Dallas Theological Seminary. After a stressful trip, it's never easy to travel with a nursing baby and a U-Haul pulling another vehicle. And then after a very difficult first week in Dallas that included a car accident and identity theft, we needed to register our vehicle and get our Texas driver's licenses. This was more than a logistical task. It was sort of symbolic. Texas plates and Texas driver's licenses would mean that we were no longer citizens of the show me state and we're now going to be residents of the Lone Star State. It took a little bit of courage to walk up the steps of the courthouse and begin the transaction. After a few deep breaths and as many prayers, we went inside to stoically seal the deal. However, we quickly learned that our planned transaction would be delayed because they only took cash or local checks, neither of which we possessed. So we retreated back to our vehicle somewhat deflated because we weren't sure we could summon the courage again to make what felt like a no turning back decision. Our daughter, seven months old, sat innocently behind us in her car seat, looking out the window at Dealey Plaza, swinging her chubby feet and sucking both her index and middle fingers. At this point, the second thoughts about this adventure we had been suppressing came to the surface like a beach ball trying to be held under the surface of the water. Out of our front windshield was a sign for 35 North, the route we could take all the way back to Kansas City, or even better, all the way to Interstate 80, which would take us back home. Yulinda's comment broke the silence. We could pay for DTS to ship our stuff home. That moment seemed torn. We felt called to Dallas, but the place to which we felt called didn't feel good. The cliche, you're never more safe than when you're in the will of God, hit something like a Midwestern farmer would spread on his field. We missed the Midwest and felt the angst of wondering where God wanted us and what it would feel like wherever that place turned out to be. This feeling comes to my mind when I consider what Jesus is likely wrestling with in our gospel text this morning, the, the second Sunday of Lent. So let's unpack the narrative of Luke 13, 31 to 35. First, these verses cannot be read in isolation. 96 and a half miles from Jerusalem, where Jesus is now entering, is Mount Tabor, T-A-B-O-R. Do you remember what happened on top of that sacred mountain? We looked at that story a few weeks ago. The transfiguration, the manifestation of Jesus, the Son of God, in all his glory. Luke 9, 29 to 31 says this, and while Jesus was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to Jesus. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, and this is critical, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Moses, the standard lawgiver, and Elijah, the prototypical prophet, are having a conversation about and with Jesus. They discuss his departure. That's the Greek word exodon, which likely reminds you of the second book of the Bible, Exodus. They're talking about Jesus' exodus 
which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Moses and Elijah declare the Messiah has a destiny that is intertwined with Jerusalem. With that overheard conversation between Elijah and Moses ringing in his ears, Luke says this about Jesus in Luke 9, 51 to 53. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him. Why? Because his face was set toward Jerusalem. This is Luke's way of building tension as Jesus moves from Mount Tabor to Jerusalem, 96 and a half miles. Tension is developing. God's call on Jesus' life necessarily involves him staring down Jerusalem. Also important to the context of our text this morning are the events leading up to verses 31 to 35 in the chapter Luke 13. Jesus didn't make any friends when he proclaimed that when he proclaimed that karma is a lie. When someone suffers, if you look at verses 1 to 5, Jesus proclaims that we cannot conclude they must be a worse sinner than us because to Jesus and his kingdom, karma is a lie. Jesus says all of us, even Jerusalem itself, must repent. Look at verse 3. Jesus says, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish. Verse five, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, even those living in Jerusalem, you will all perish just as they did. Jesus tells us, secondly, that we must bear a certain kind of fruit that keeps with repentance. What kind of fruit does the right kind of uh, repentance produce? Jesus describes the kind of fruit by exposing the fruit of hypocrisy. Jesus says these trees that don't bear fruit are going to be taken down. That's a promise of the judgment that's going to come on Jerusalem because it doesn't have the right kind of repentance bearing the right kind of fruit. Look at verse 10. Jesus was teaching in the synagogues on the Sabbath, and there appeared there a woman with a spirit that had been crippled, that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unstable to stand up straight. Jesus calls her. She comes to him. Woman, you are set free from her ailment. When he had laid his hands on her immediately, she stood up straight and began praising God. But, and again, the tension is developing here. The leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done, but on those days, come and be cured not on the Sabbath day. Beloved, the fruit of hypocrisy, the wrong kind of repentance, wonders if, does my religion allow me to help so-and-so? The kind of fruit that is on display in a Galilean synagogue where we find a woman who has been bent over by evil for 18 years, we'd like to help the synagogue leaders say, but Today's the Sabbath, and God would frown on such a thing. Jesus responds in Aramaic, that's stupid. Or more thoroughly, and ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? Church, if our understanding of Christianity places limits on who we are allowed to love and serve. Ours is a Christianity without Christ. Pastor Brian Zond offers us a wise summary. He writes, when we are suffering, when we see suffering, the question is not who can we blame? The question is how can we help? Beloved, when we follow Jesus and see suffering, the question we ask is not who can we blame? question is, how can we help? We need to consider one more highlight from chapter 13 in order for verses 31 to 35 to hit us as Luke intends. Look at verse 22 and following. Jesus went through one town and village after another, 
teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? Like, why aren't people following us as we go to Jerusalem to set up your kingdom? He said to them, verse 24, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. When once the owner of the house has got up and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us. Then in reply, he will say to you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank with you and you taught us in the streets. But he will say, I do not know where you come from. Go away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrown out. Then people will come from the east and west, from the north and south, and will eat in the kingdom of God. Indeed, some are last who will be first and some who are first will be last. These verses elaborate on the image of verses six to nine, the image of the fig tree. Those who, because of religious power, exclude those who need the healing touch of the great physician, they will experience at the end of days their own exclusion. Then Jesus promises when that happens, People will come from the east and west, from the north and south, and will eat in the kingdom of God. Indeed, some are last who will be first, and some who are first will be last. You see, Jesus says, yes, many, many people are going to enjoy this eternal feast, but the people who won't are the people who, for religion's sake, excluded people and said, sorry, religion doesn't allow me to love and serve. Those are the type of people Jesus isn't saving. With these images in mind, now verses 31 to 35 kind of explain themselves. Two details I want us to notice from 31 to 35. First, notice the conflict of wants, desires, wants. Pharisees, who, by the way, in Luke's gospel are somewhat positive or at the very worst, neutral. They come to Jesus and they warn him that Herod, what? Look with me at verse 31. Herod wants to kill you. The word there underneath the word once is the Greek word "thelo." Secondly, Jesus wants same word, thelo, to restore and shelter the people of Israel. How often, verse 34, I have wanted to gather your children together as a, hand, as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not wanting, you were not willing. Jerusalem plays the role of an antagonist in the story. We see what God wants revealed in Jesus and then what Jerusalem wants revealed by how they kill the prophets. And these two things are going to collide. Jerusalem is personified in this story. Jerusalem is the antagonist in this story. Jesus knows that Jerusalem has a history of killing the prophets God sends. And still, chapter 9, verse 51, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem, the city that kills prophets, the city he knows will kill him. In Luke's story, this city is the Joker. This city is Darth Vader. This city is Emperor Palpatine. This city is Lord Voldemort. This city is Thanos. This city is Lord Sauron. This city is Vladimir Putin. And how does Jesus describe his emotions toward Jerusalem? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, verse 34. The city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I have desired. How would we like Jesus to finish that lament? 
How often have I desired to shatter your teeth in your mouth? Psalm 58, verse 6. How often have I desired to dash the heads of your little ones against rocks? Psalm 137, verse 9. How often have I desired to treat you like you have treated the prophets God sent you? No. Even though Jesus had these texts at his disposal, instead, he reflects to us the image of a God who loves even his enemies sacrificially. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jesus says, the city that kills the prophets and those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. Why will there be weeping and gnashing of teeth? Why will there be exclusion from the joy of the eternal banquet? Not because God gets some sort of strange pleasure from excluding his enemies from the joy of his presence. Instead, the God who creates a supper of eternal joy laments that there are those who are not willing laments that there are those who don't want the joy he offers them. You were not willing, he says to Jerusalem. Same word, fellow. God will force himself on no one. God gives God's image bearers what they want. That is why some will be excluded from that glorious meal. Furthermore, it's the religious rule keepers who refuse to help the needy who will weep and rebelliously gnash their teeth. Jesus sets his face for Jerusalem because that city is where the conflict between what God wants and what political and religious power wants to enter into a conflict and settle that conflict once and for all. God desires, in the words of St. Peter, that all repent. God desires us to repent. God desires me to repent and you too because God wants a full table in the age to come. One of my favorite professors, John Hanna, used to say, when I get to heaven, I'll be surprised at who is there, who is not there, and that I am there. That captures the spirit of the kind of person Jesus is saving. No, we don't earn our salvation by helping those in need. But when Jesus is saving us, when we have repented and turned to him, he will turn us into people who don't let religion get in the way of love. Notice that at Jerusalem, we have the conflict of wants. Secondly, notice Jesus' name for Herod. What does he call Herod? Get away from Jerusalem, for Herod wants to kill you. This warning from Jesus' religious friends will not deter him, because Herod and the power he represents is insignificant to Jesus. The Pharisees believe that Herod poses a threat to Jesus and his mission. The Pharisees advise Jesus to set his face away from Jerusalem because they're afraid Herod will execute Jesus like he executed John the Baptist. By the way, John the Baptist had the audacity to call Herod to repentance. Just like the Satan, the Pharisees offer Jesus influence without suffering, a crown without a cross. How does Jesus respond? You are overestimating King Herod. There's nothing that Herod can take away from us that God won't restore to us at the resurrection. In our context, we understand a fox as sneaky, cunning, and hard to keep away from the chicken coop. That image is relevant to Aesop's fables, but doesn't really match the dismissive tone contained in Jesus' words. Go, go and tell that fox for me. Herod isn't even worth a face-to-face conversation. Go and tell that fox for me, Jesus says. I think perhaps the Old Testament provides the context for Jesus' label instead of our own Aesop's fables context. 
In texts like Ezekiel 13.4 and Lamentations 5.18, Jerusalem is described as being overtaken by jackals, the Hebrew word shalah. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament that Jesus likely read uses the same word in those Old Testament texts that Jesus uses in Luke 13 to name Herod. He's not a cunning fox. He's a jackal. He's a hyena. He's a nuisance. He's a scavenger. He's a useless creature that can be scared away with a stick. A creature that if you throw a few rocks at him, he'll run away. Herod is something that in terms of God's salvation plan, will be able to be scared away rather easily. This is how Jesus understood Herod and how he invites us to regard the rulers of this age that is passing away. Church, in our discipleship to Jesus, we must resist the temptation to allow the foxes and jackals of today to occupy too much space in our minds. Do we need to be concerned about what that jackal Vladimir Putin is up to? Yes. Does he need to be stopped? Yes. But can he thwart God's ultimate plan of salvation? Can he interfere with God's promise to restore all things, including Russia, Ukraine? No. Go tell that fox that Jesus is coming to cast out demons, that Jesus is coming to defeat evil. We must live and move and think and sleep and pray like King Jesus is more real than that fox, Vladimir Putin. In the words of Lee Camp, what is most real is not the scheming of tyrants or the lies of those in power. What is most real is not that might makes right or that greatness is defined by the size of one's arsenal. What is most real, we Christians claim, is the power of God revealed in one who suffers in love and trusts that right has been made right, not through might, but through mercy, repentance, and resurrection. On the second Sunday of Lent, we are invited to receive the real mercy of God. On the second Sunday of Lent, we are invited to embrace the good news of repentance. On this second Sunday of Lent, we are invited to live in hope of resurrection. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, we ask for your mercy. We ask for your intervention. We ask for the faith to believe that you are King of kings and Lord of lords, that you have been installed as king over Russia, over Ukraine, and we ask you to wield your transforming, merciful power that we might experience peace in our time. We pray through the Son and by the Spirit, and all of us said together, Amen. I now invite you to receive our final benediction. And now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and through grace gave us eternal comfort and good hope. Comfort your hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word. And all of us said together, amen. May grace and peace and everything good be yours in King Jesus.